Um, Deirdre, the, uh, could you mute everybody? Because uh, there's one person who, the one no. person who has the telephone is not muted. Yeah, I, I can't. Okay, I can mute them. There we go. And Michael Dean, you're not muted. And Wendy, you're not muted. Mute your says mute. Mute thyself. I, I've got it. Okay. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you, Deirdre. Deirdre has been doing incredible work putting all these great gatherings together throughout the Meptau Valley. Just really interesting stuff. And uh, I'm, I have done these readings. I did these readings last winter also. And they're stories that were not in my book, The, Met the Whole Damn Valley, um, because I just went through my boxes and found stories that I thought were interesting. So these are ones that are playing on the radio because I went and recorded on the local radio station 168 stories. So um, I'm surprised when Deirdre said that <laughs> he sometimes plays five in an hour. I don't listen to the radio. So I don't hear myself and, and, <laughs> I, don't, and I don't care to. <laughs> I only listen to it when I'm in the car. Well, me too. Yeah. And, and <laughs> once in a while, I'll hear it. <laughs> I got to go into Hank's anyway, and I'll turn it off and go. Anyway, there it is. All right. Um, I'm going to read a few stories. I don't know how many I'll get through, but I'm going to tell you which ones they are right now so that um, you can know. One is on party lines. One's on Jim Sparks, who is a hunter. Jim Kimball, a logging truck driver, and Harry Adams, uh, I read a story about his hands, and he was a, a rancher, former, and Mose Kruger, who was an Indian, who was a rodeo uh, rider, par excellence. And um, maybe if I get to it, a little story on the old Merck, um, Twist Merck, which is now the theater, and one on Lola Lockhart. Just like we're neighbors. Jim yeah, and Jim and Doris and Michelle were neighbors of Lola Lockhart. Okay, so I'm gonna start with one called The Party's Over. So much for parties in the Metau Valley. I wrote this for the Wenatchee World in October 15th, 1991. So we're talking, what, 31 years ago. So much for parties in the Meta Valley, party lines, that is. About 400 subscribers who make up 19% of all phone owners in the Valley presently have one to three par other parties on their line. But by the end of 1991, everyone on the TWISP exchange, 997, will have their phones switched over to private lines and by the end of 1992, everyone in Winthrop and Mazama areas will be private, say PTI communication officials. Pacific Telecom Incorporated is upgrading systems throughout Eastern Washington, bringing one party service to some of the more remote areas under its jurisdiction. Is everyone ready for the switchover? Seems so said Dale Wells, central office technician in the TWIST PTI headquarters. People are demanding more and more in the way of communication, he said, and they want it faster and faster. The banks of humming circuitry Wells now maintains are so sophisticated that Wells's vocabulary has had to expand by gigahertz. The technology that now zips voices from here to any old where contrasts with the antiquated telephone system that existed in the Valley not very long ago. Aaron Burkhart of Mazama, 34 years on his party line, looks forward to picking up a phone and having a line right away. It'll be good to say what you think without worrying about others on the line, he said. You sometimes damn near have to go somewhere else to call, he groused. Used to be you could hear the receivers being picked up, he went on. They'd go click, click, click. One gal had asthma 
trouble. You could hear her listening real clear. <laughs> one old guy got so exasperated one time, he said to everyone listening in, if you'd all just hang up so I can hear, I'll call you all back and tell you what we said. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for a private line, Burkhart said, even if it does cost a dollar or two more a month. Jay Stokes, a party line member for the last 46 years, acknowledged a lot of rubbernecking went on over his party line. Two or three made a habit of it, he drawled, before TV more than likely. Nedra Horn, whose parents bought the first Victrola in the valley, recalls that they occasionally took their phone off the hook in the evening so that the that any of the 17 families on their line could enjoy a little crooning of Caruso. <laughs> well, into the 1950s, telephone lines were still strung between fence posts. It only took two wires to make a circuit, said Slug Davis, who worked with the phone company then, helping to restring lines on legitimate poles. Incidentally, his own birth, uh, in 1923 was broadcast fast via switchboard. Just after we were born, uh, Raymond and I were twins, mother called my father from the birthing clinic at the foot of the hill. Of course, Florabelle, who was the operator, heard it and she took care of the whole town, Davis said. <laughs> Florabelle Hicks, telephone switchboard operator for the Winthrop's West Side Telephone Company in the early days of the invention, acted as the town's human scanner. She earned 15 cents an hour as she roused the doctor at midnight, rallied every able-bodied person for fires, recruited forest firefighters and broadcast troop movements, victories and defeats in Europe during World War I. During emergencies, she'd ring the alarm across the board People with phones snatched up the receiver to learn what the crisis was. If fire threatened, they'd dash out the door, grabbing every bucket at hand. People here still remember their code rings, the longs and the shorts, which alerted different parties on the line. Yep, ours was two longs and two shorts, said Florence Sonicson, who once lived on the one line that ran the length of the Twist River Road in the 1920s. Wow. I don't remember a lot of things, but I do remember that. Two longs and two shorts, she said. <laughs> Others say they didn't make calls very often except in dire circumstances. In fact, it was accepted policy for when you could and couldn't visit on the line. The pocket-sized phone book covering the Metau Valley in the early 1920s stated this, no visiting allowed from 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. or from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. or from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. and do not visit over five minutes at other times. Reason why? as those are hours when most of the business goes out over the lines, so they must not be used for visiting conversations. Second, someone may call for your number and you may miss an important call or a good deal. <laughs> the company urged owners to notify the operator if they were not gonna be home for the day so she could tell anyone calling. Sometimes it's a good plan to ask a neighbor, a nearby neighbor to answer your phone when you are away, the phone book suggested. <laughs> Besides the Meta Valley, other areas having their parties eliminated include Kettle Falls, Chewila, Cheney, Medical Lake, Davenport, Reardon, Inchileum, Hunters, Connell, Mesa, Colotus, Washtuckna, Basin City, Matthews Corner, Eltopia and Spangle. <laughs> also, the new optic fiber cable being buried the length of the valley will soon improve long distance capability beyond even the present needs of this thinly populated area. One fiber alone, up to 16 are being buried along the roadway, can carry 2,016 phone conversations at one time. 
All righty, that was Party Lines. Wonderful. <laughs> this uh, story is about Jim Sparks and it's called No More Living on the Frontier. And I wrote it for the Wenatchee World on October 13th, 1986. Times have changed for the frontiersmen, but there are those who still remember what it was like to have to hunt and trap to stay alive. Today, faced with paying fees for licenses, tags, stamps, and permits, they stay within the bounds, live in mobile homes instead of log cabins, and buy at the grocery store instead of catching a grouse on the wing. Jim Spark, 68, avid hunter, ex-trapper. Oh, I, wait a minute, I've got a picture of him here, hold on. Um, Jim Sparks, 68, avid hunter, ex-trapper, past packer and dog team mailman, is never more at home than when he has a firearm in his hands. Hunting and fishing, that's all I live for, he said recently. It's all I've ever done. Same with my dad and granddad, the whole bunch of us, it's in my blood. Sparks and his father drove the gravel road from Wenatchee to the Meta Valley in 1926 to settle down as close to the wilderness as they could get on Lost River past Mazama. From the time that his dad bought him his first gun, a 22 bolt action rifle, Sparks relied on his aim and savvy to keep food on the table and money in his pocket. Food and money was sort of scarce then, he understated about growing up in the 30s. He lived on venison and wild birds. He augmented his income, earned by packing supplies into the Gold Hill Mine and carrying mail by dog team into the Azurite Mine with bounties paid on animal pelts. Back when a trapping license cost $5 instead of today's 150, the, that is the 86, 1986 today. Sparks and a partner, Romy Johnson, trapped Martin, earning $42 a pelt. They made two lines, one 14 miles long up toward the headwaters of the Metau River, the other 11 miles up Robinson Creek. Every day, Sparks would snowshoe one of the lines, breaking trail through deep snow the whole way. They baited their number two jump traps with horse meat and fish guts, and Martin were drawn to them like magnets. They were easy to trap, said Sparks. It was a shame, really. But you gotta make a living. Plenty of bear, too, got in the way of Sparks' bullets. But now he has some regrets. I've killed more bear then Carter has pills. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why I did it. I'm not proud of it. I don't even like the meat. I'm all through shooting them now. Cougar at the upper end of the valley were thinned out largely due to sparks and cougar enthusiast Jack Wilson, who kept hounds for that purpose. Back in the late 1940s, bounties ranged from $50 to $100 per cougar. When the bounty was removed, the men stopped hunting them. The thrill of the chase still courses in Sparks' blood. He recalls the first time he and Wilson hunted cougar. Jack didn't give 10 cents for my life when I crawled under that rock to get at it. Instead of leaping into a tree, the cougar eluded the men and their dogs by diving under a huge boulder. Having already tracked it five miles in 20 below zero weather, the men knew they couldn't wait for the animal to surface or they'd freeze to death. They flipped a coin. Sparks lost. <laughs> My luck never has been particularly good, he smiled. He crawled under the rock played a dim flashlight beam around in the darkness until it snagged on two big eyes. Sparks fired and missed. Fired again and missed again. 
With nothing at that point to lose, he leaned forward, laid his 38 Smith & Wesson between the cat's eyes and pulled the trigger for the last time. There's nothing like it, Sparks said of the chase, especially with the hounds obeying. Also, shooting a big buck gives me a big thrill. You never get over it. However, Sparks admitted that nowadays, I'd just as soon leave the gun at home. He must be speaking comparatively because at this very moment, he's probably sighting in on a fat goose flying through the blue skies in the middle of the state. And he confided that when he goes south this winter to Arizona, he has, plenty, he has plans to try his hand at hunting wild turkeys and javelina. I've got guns that won't quit, he added, laying out a few of his favorites. Here's a 300 Savage. I've killed more deer with this than you could stack in this trailer. It's a dandy. You could drive a tack with it. This old Ithaca is for the birds. It's 30 years old. And this one, a model 870 Remington three inch Magnum is a big baby. I can't hit the broadside of a barn with it. Geese are perfectly safe with me around when I've got this gun. <laughs> Sparks left the valley in 1959 to work on the coast, but he comes back to this side of the mountain every time, every chance he gets, spending most of his summers since retirement here. Every year for 40 years, he's assigned himself the task of placing 200 pounds of block salt at Dead Horse Point on the road up to Hart's Pass so that deer and mountain goats can get at it. When he wasn't fishing this past summer, he was driving that Hearts Pass road to enjoy the sight of herds of wild animals, something he still considers an incomparable experience, and he feels right at home. I know that country like a book all the way to the Canada line, he said. Those were the happiest days of my life, living there on Lost, Lost River and being in those mountains. Outside his trailer parked at Riverbend Trailer Park, just north of Twisp here, his hummingbird feeder swings empty. You have to stop filling it at a certain point, he said, because if the hummingbirds get used to it, they'll stick around too late for them to fly south. It'll, it'll fall, foul up their instincts. Sparks is still tuned into animal ways. But from second guessing cougars to being concerned about migrating hum hummingbirds is just an inkling of how times have changed for frontiersmen like Jim Sparks. All right. All right, I'm going to show you another picture here. Um, I have to delete that so I can go. All right. This one's about Jim Kimball, who is a logging truck driver here in the valley. And I wrote it for the Wenatchee World, January 20th, 1989. I hadn't realized I'd met Jim Kimball before. The other day when Kimball pulled over in his Mac Lloyd logging truck to let me aboard, I clambered up, and I mean up, into the cab, and we introduced ourselves. He gave me a second glance and said we had met a few winters back. Uh, I remembered that moment distinctly. It was a day of no-nonsense ice. I was headed down the Twist River Road to town in my pickup. At the top of death-defying Spokane grade, I slowed to a stop so I could calculate my chances of making it. Halfway down the decline, there was a commotion, so I headed down on foot to investigate. There stood Jim Kimball, though I didn't know his name at the time, staring over the bank. At the bottom of the ravine, his truck lay at rest. Logs festooned the hillside. Shaking his head, he muttered, second time this week, something like this has happened to me. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, this man has seen the last of his truck driving days. Yet Jim Kimball was the one who picked me up for a logging run. He admitted that that particular incident was actually his third, not his second, mishap of that season. 
all caused by other people being in his way. In each instance, Kimball had opted to go over the edge rather than collide with the vehicles and risk hurting someone. Normally, Kimball doesn't make a habit of this sort of thing. He knew at the time somebody was trying to tell him something, but some momentum shoved him back into the driver's seat the following morning. You know, there aren't a whole lot of other ways in this valley to earn a wage, he allowed. Kimball has worked for Mac Lloyd for 10 years, one of over 20 logging trucks that Lloyd employs for his company in the Meta Valley. These winter days, Kimball works from dark to dark. He hauls logs from timber sales up the numerous side valleys of the Metau to the sawmill in Omac over the Loop Loop Pass, chalking up three or four trips a shift. The odometer just rolled over the 143,000 mile mark on the year and a half old truck. Wow. Sure, he rides in a heated cab on an airbag seat, which smooths out the bumps, but it's amazing how 75,000 pounds of truck can leap along the highways and the side roads like a cat on a hot wood stove. Most people do not envy the men who carry 50,000 pounds of logs over winter roads, but Kimball wouldn't dream of having anyone think his job was difficult. It's an easy job for an old guy, said Jim, 52. <laughs> You're out of the weather. You're barely ever seeing, you barely ever see any bosses. No one's peering down your neck. I've always been treated right. The hardest part of his job is the boredom, he admits, though it's worse than the summer heat. 37 tons just can't burn uphill very fast. So taking the pass at 28 miles an hour can get tedious. Equipped with chains for 10 tires, a fully loaded rig can slide on bad roads on bad days. First four or five years, I used to get a thrill out of that, but I don't like it so much anymore. But it's not dangerous if you're careful. His words trail off. We both remember cars spinning in slow motion in the wrong place. I also recall laughing uneasily the day before when shop foreman Vernon Bain joked to me, if he jumps, don't wait too long before you do the same. <laughs> it's not really an easy job. As Kimball guided the truck up the narrow road of Texas Creek, he radioed his whereabouts to whomever was in the area listening in. Anyone coming the other way, and you better believe a loaded truck has right of way, would hear and respond. At the timber sale, Loggers sharpened their saws standing by bonfires or headed back into the snowy woods. I asked Kimball if he had ever wanted to be a logger. His answer was an emphatic no. You know, it's a funny deal, he said, as he backed the rig up to the loader run by Wally Stewart. A logging truck driver wouldn't be caught dead falling trees, and a logger wouldn't be caught dead driving truck. As the prehensile arm of Stewart's loader plucked logs from the pile and swung them onto Kimball's trailer, Kimball watched an electronic scale automatically weighing each delivery. He had to make sure no more than 50,000 pounds of logs got loaded. Most fun I have all day is this calculation, Kimball grinned. He helped the guys tighten the cables around the load and we were off, he calling his position into the blue as we descended, going cautiously to avoid local drivers. Kimball harbors no king of the road delusions, feels no compulsion to harass lesser vehicles. A woman once yelled at him and it made me feel that small, he said, thumb and forefinger an inch apart. At OMAC Wood Products, Kimball maneuvered through canyons of stacked logs, coming to a halt where a monstrous piece of equipment clenched its steel talons around Kimball's entire load and lifted it with ease off the truck. He then headed west, back over the loop loop for another go at Texas Creek, 
then back over the pass to Omac, then back to Texas Creek. So that was Jim Kimball. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to stop here for a second. How are we doing on time? All right. Good. Um, the hands of Harry Adams. This is a rather calmer story here. Um, it's about Harry Adams. I wrote it for the Meta Valley News, September 20th, 1984. Slim as the splinter of a fence post, Harry Adams has hands out of proportion with the rest of him. They've been his workforce, handling rains when he worked the fields by horse, shocking wheat for years in slab flat Montana, doing the million and one chores during his 79 years on farms. It took time for his right hand to get back into action after he nearly severed his arm off a few years back. I stuck my arm in the baler. I knew it. I shouldn't have done it there. I knew I shouldn't have had it in there, but it slapped me, he said. Up the far end of Beaver Creek, Harry and Esther still live on the place they bought in 1951. His son Larry and his family live there also. When Esther and I drove in here the first time, something hit me. This was the place I wanted to be, and I haven't wanted to leave here since. Not that it's been all roses either, but then where is it all roses? Certainly not where he began, Kansas, then North Central Montana, Iowa, and North Dakota. Took up a homestead and starved out, he said bluntly. You just can't make, dry, make it dry land farming with horses. No rain fell those years. For three of those years, we drove a team of horses pulling a hay rake 300 miles east to work the harvest. I was 14, 15. We worked younger then than they do nowadays. I was out with the men. Pretty soon, things went on the rocks. So we'd pack up and go where we thought money was. When it wasn't there, we'd look around for someplace else to go broke. <laughs> When I started out farming on my own, I used horses and couldn't make a dime. Then I got a John Deere in 1935. Then it was all like this. And here his big hand described a nice, smooth, upward swing. But smooth, it obviously wasn't. First it was dry, and he meant dry. Then it rained too much. It was all too much. And in 1944, they turned their backs on Montana and headed for Washington. In Sunnyside, they cleared 90 acres and put it to wheat, peas, beans, corn, potatoes, vineyard, peach orchard, and he built a house. I worked too hard, I guess, he said, and got disgusted. So he retired in 1950. What exactly does retirement mean to Harry's way of thinking? Well, he said, it was just a notion. I ended up busier than before. It was around then that they strayed into the Metau Valley around dark and stuck around for the next 23 years, building up a quality herd of cattle. He still never misses a day of work around the farm. He bailed, hey, yesterday Esther put in, Harry doesn't respond, just knows it in his bones. When he wasn't actively out working on the farm, he joined a number of agricultural organizations. He was named Farmer of the Year, 19 years after he so-called retired. <laughs> if you haven't run into Harry around town much, it's not surprising considering he still works most daylight hours. He did buy a television a few years back, but admits that them things spoiled the neighborhood. Once in a while, he found himself at the Beaver Creek schoolhouse playing cards. 
Once, you know, someone shook his fist at me over those cards and that was the end of it. I am just not the fighting kind. He never has used those powerful hands of his for anything so unproductive as fighting. Once, he almost punched a kid out in the schoolyard umpteen years ago, but he never did. And now he can't even remember what the argument was all about. Okay, I'm going to read to you about Mose Kruger. I've got a good picture of Mose. There he is. <laughs> All right, Mose Kruger. Uh, I wrote this for the Wenatchee World in uh, May 17th, 1990. And they, they titled it, I Spurred the Hell Out of Them. At 80, cowboy Mose Kruger, part Okanagan Indian and part German, is still all sinew. The former professional saddle bronc rider still stands straight in the shade of his Stetson, only a slightly smaller version of the Mose Kruger of the 1930s and 40s, pictured in row upon row of eight by 10 glossies thumbtacked to his living room wall. One photo shows Mose leaving Snake. Now, leaving is a benign verb for the fearsome act of leaping from a still crazed horse after the final buzzer. Not obvious to a casual observer of the photo is that Moses' leg was already shattered. On exiting the chute, Snake had slammed Mose up against a post, but had failed to unsaddle him. The photographer caught Mose mid-leap. The landing must have been torture. In another photo, Mose rides in fine form on the vast heaving back of Badger Mountain, one of the toughest rides of all time. The one next to that catches Mose on one shoulder in the dirt. He just left, and that's a quote, he, he had just left whiz bang faster than he intended. There's another of the legend called Screaming High Kai. This was not a horse who tolerated being ridden, and he seldom ever was. It's not merely a picture of Moe's on the back of Screaming High Kai. This is a picture of Moe's with a broken back on the back of Screaming High Kai. After that ride in Portland, Oregon, Moe's was paralyzed for four and a half months. As he was lowering himself onto the animal in the chute, the beast behaved in a predictably unpredictable manner. He reared back, hurling Mose against the boards. They both fell, Mose underneath. They couldn't get to me for quite a while, Mose said matter-of-factly. When he was finally extracted, he ignored his pain and asked for a little time to get repositioned. <laughs> The men who worked the gates told him to go ahead, say when he was ready. I rode him, he said. I spurred the hell out of him. For more than 25 years, Mose Kruger wanted nothing better than to climb onto half wild horses. He leapt right into professional rodeoing at the age of 17 without first testing the amateur circuit. He traveled steadily from ring to ring from Vancouver, BC to Pendleton, Oregon, hitting the big time early on. He competed in world championships with world champions, sometimes beating them. He rode the best stock of the best bucking stock breeders from Alberta to Idaho, soaring on the excitement when he rode to the buzzer and heard the crowds yelling in the bandstands. Obviously, there were some disadvantages. I broke my leg so darn many times, he said, eight times to be exact. <laughs> I broke my back and was paralyzed. My ribs have all broke. My wrists cracked, but they don't bother me. 
He endured so much pain that he threw down the painkillers to mask it, which in turn ate holes in his stomach, which doctors to this day try to staunch. And two, emphysema dogs him, brought on by the considerable smoking he did. He admitted he was nervous before rides and would smoke up a storm. The ground behind the chutes must have been half dirt, half butts. <laughs> he was 44 years old when he finally thought, well, I might as well quit. This salutary idea occurred to him not long after a ride in which the horse decided not to go out the gate like any self-respecting drunk would do. No, sir, he leapt over the top. Oh my God. Moses' leg got caught between bars. It got all twisted up, he explained. When I fell, the horse trumped me, my face and chest. Oh the tissue of my heart pulled loose. Doctors told me to lie still and not even talk. About that time, he decided to quit pitting himself against the devils. Born in Penticton, BC in 1910, Mose rode racehorses that his father raised from the age of 11. He grew up breaking horses and knowing how to get horses to buck. He kept in shape by running flat out, running for half a mile, and then jumping in a lake to harden his muscles. Before a ride, he jumped up and down to limber up his legs and flail his arms around to get them loose. Then he said, I just get on and go. Mose, who became a US citizen 50 years ago, lives near Brewster by the confluence of the Columbia and Okanagan rivers. He raised cattle there from the early 1940s until just last year when failing health forced him to sell the stock. However, back in the corral, two handsome racehorses grazed today. He showed me a fine new saddle with silver edging. No one, no matter what, is going to keep Moe's Kruger off a horse. That's fabulous. <laughs> How are we doing in time-wise? Is that uh, maybe a little short one? We're doing great. Yes. You yeah. are doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we do one more then? Sure. Okay, one, one short one. Um, shall I do a little Lockhart for, I'll do a little Lockhart for the Kissners. I wrote it for the Wenatchee World, uh, December 29th, 1989. It's not one of nature's finest works of art, asymmetrical and pouchy. It isn't even lovely to look at when braided and decked in dry flowers. Nonetheless, for centuries, people have used it to rid themselves of colds, high blood pressure, and heart arrhythmia. It cuts phlegm, shrinks hemorrhoids, and fights gonorrhea. It kills certain germs at a distance of 40 feet. And what, pray, wields such power? Garlic. <laughs> Lola Lockhart, a staunch believer in natural remedies, lives in Twisp, keeps a container of garlic on her dining room table. Every day she chops a clove into little slivers and chews them up. Should anyone with sniffles come into her presence, she unceremoniously lunges for her garlic jar, quickly peels a clove, pokes holes in it with a pin, and puts it in her mouth to ward off the germs emanating from that hapless person. <laughs> Garlic is one of the oldest healers there is from what I've gathered from my readings, Mrs. Lockhart said, waving a hand at shelves and shelves of books dealing with health. By the way, she continued, if you're self-conscious about the smell of it, just chew some parsley. Parsley not only kills the odor of garlic, but has vitamin A, which is good for your skin, hair, and eyes. A remarkable 78 years old, Lola Lockhart bathes in ground comfrey leaves for her joints and makes ear oil for herself, her family and dog out of mullen blossoms and olive oil. 
citing her profuse intake of cayenne pepper as another major factor in her health. She said, I haven't had the flu or a temperature since 1929. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've had a cough or two, but never anything that's kept me in bed an hour. I must be doing something right. She asserted, illustrating her words by bounding up from her desk and throwing a foot up onto a high back of a chair. Mrs. Lockhart says another aid to good health is to rub a combination of wintergreen oil, pure olive oil, and rubbing alcohol between your hands and smell it, but gingerly at first because it's powerful, she warned. Then rub it on your neck and around your nostrils, she said. She also recommends soaking one's feet in hot water, rubbing mentholatum on them and covering them with wool socks, especially for the elderly whose circulation to extremities is diminished. This spring, she is starting a business devoted to natural health research. I've gotta be doing something for others, not just me, she said. Otherwise, I don't see much reason to stick around. It's never too late to do something. As long as you can get up and go, she said, and as long as you still have got something upstairs, she added, tapping her head. Okay, that's enough for now. <laughs> oh, um, wonderful. What a great story. Uh, well, that was <laughs> super. Oh, I love that. My Thank favorite you. stories are of the logger, the logging driver, and the cowboy. Those were my favorites. <laughs> All right. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, I had a great life writing these stories and just and meeting these people, you know, I mean, it was such a such a treat, such an honor to be able to, you know, go up to someone like Jim Kimball and say, hey, can I ride, ride around in your logging truck with you because I want to write a story, you know, I, I, it was a, it was a great life. I, I did it for about 18 years, you know. You We're learn so much yeah. when you interview your subjects, you learn about all these arcane details of other people's professions, like how to ride a horse and uh, <laughs> the ins and outs of being a trucker as opposed to a tree cutter and so on and so forth. Yeah. And right. that's lovely. It's almost like being an anthropologist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to cure anybody. I mean, you know, 